When I was three or four years old at the peak of the millennia, my big sister, who I haven't been close to in most of my life now, introduced me to Sonic the Hedgehog. She had a Sega Master System in her room, hooked up to a dusty CRT with a fancy onboard VHS player, and I ended up spending so long in that house in her room that I can't remember what my room looked like. Before I was 11 years old and ready to start high school, my small nuclear family moved about 11 times all around Britain. Because of this, I made many fleeting and temporary friends that have now either fallen to memory storage decay, or live on as blurry fragments in the furthest recesses of my mind. When I look back at my childhood, and who I spent most of my time with, it would have been video game characters. Sonic the Hedgehog, in particular. I never completed the original trilogy of games by myself until about three years ago. We eventually got a Sega Genesis, and my sister would always swoop in to save my ass before the game over screen prompted the game to restart from Zone 1 all over again. My relationship with Retro Sonic was therefore a strained one. I never succumbed to gamer rage or anything similar, but I did come pretty damn close. So Retro Sonic introduced me to the world of gaming, but it wasn't until my 7th birthday when my big brother purchased for me a Nintendo GameCube that I truly fell in love with the mascot. In the next few years I absorbed every single Sonic game I could, Adventure, Gems, Heroes, Mega Collection, Riders, even Shadow the Hedgehog was a grim, realistic depiction that I, for whatever reason, adored. Probably the soundtrack. Though there was one game in particular that really stole the show. One game that I could not stop playing, and still think about, weekly. Sonic Adventure 2 Battle is a GameCube remastering of the critically acclaimed Dreamcast game Sonic Adventure 2. It tells a Dragon Ball sci-fi story of lunar annihilation, genetic mutation, and eldritch grotesqueries. Believe it or not, it introduced me to many concepts that I hadn't seen before, and its influence can be felt throughout many artistic endeavours I've undertaken, from existentialism all the way up to cosmic horror. However, within the Sonic Adventure duology was another game, a mini-game that for me eclipsed the main game to become the selling point. In Sonic Adventure 2's case, this mini-game might actually be my favourite Sonic game. In the first zone of the game, City Escape, you can come across a cute blue box, totally out of place. Smashing this box will allow you to collect a key, and if you take any damage throughout the remainder of the level, you lose that key. I was, and am, bad at Sonic games, and therefore didn't understand this until later into the game, but if you make it to the end of the level and still possess that key, you'll be teleported somewhere unknown and unexpected. A galactic themed lobby, adorned with fine furnishing. Your camera control is taken from you, disallowing any vertical panning, but above you are picturesque white clouds across a blue gradient sky. Below you are gloomy red clouds and a bottomless abyss. This makes you feel as though you're in limbo, outside of the game and standing in a place you perhaps shouldn't be. At first, you'll only see one door across from the teleporting pad where you spawned, but on later visits, a second, third, and fourth door will appear. Crossing that first door's idyllic threshold takes you to a beautiful garden, complete with fruit-heavy palm trees, an infinite static sky and sea forever out of bounds, and a rock fixture, water cascading down its smooth contours to collect in a large pool at the bottom. The purpose of this admittedly limited locale is to serve as a backdrop to a comprehensive Tamagotchi-esque simulator. See, in Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, you can acquire eggs to hatch in this simulated chow world and feed them various edibles ascertained throughout the main level-to-level -level experience. Doing this a specific way in specific orders via specific characters allows you to breed and evolve unique and abnormal species of chow for you to race, battle, love, and eventually watch depart from this chow world. The idiosyncrasies of the chow garden cannot be understated, and were it not for the fact that others have discussed it to death, I'd probably do a video on it for its core mechanics. That's not what this video is about. In fact, as much as I do love the chow aspect of the Sonic Adventure and Advance series, I'm not even sure it was because of the chow. I spent so much time alone as a child, and for some reason didn't complain about it. Sure, I had friends now and then, and by my late primary years had developed a 
incredible ability to make intense friendships that were doomed to end, but I spent the majority of my time alone. I never ever did homework, so after school was over I would either watch cartoons, browse new grounds and game facts and neo seekers, because YouTube wasn't huge yet, play with my toys, draw with pens, because pencils are for pushovers, or, of course, engage in some video gaming. Usually in a video game I like to complete the main story and a few optional quests and then move on. To keep me in your game world, you need to immerse me beyond narrative or controls or even visual presentation, and, well, appeal to the monkey brain inside my cranium. Games like Monster Hunter, The Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, and Minecraft all appeal to my obsessive compulsive symptoms explicitly. They are designed to near enough exploit my dissociative tendency to collect, list make, ruminate, and lapse into daydream repetitivity. This isn't an accident, and I love them for it. I've played Skyrim for more than 2,500 hours across various systems. The same can be said about the Monster Hunter franchise that has taken up approximately the same amount of my life. And the less said about Minecraft, a game that consumed my high school years, the better, quite honestly. To some, those numbers may seem paltry, to others, staggeringly too high. I'm not sure how I feel about the time spent aspect, but I know it was time spent on something that gave me enjoyment, and excitement, and even sometimes, socialisation. So why did I spend maybe the same amount of time in the Chow world? Sure, Chow are cute and the kung fu and racing minigames are fun, levelling them up and watching them evolve was a treat, and I did care about my chow, but I think it was the garden itself. I would run and bounce around the garden like the empty Eden it was and just meditate. I'd stare at the screen and turn off my body and repeat little routines or routes to perfection in my own mind. I know it's uncanny, but it's something that still gets to me today. The thing that appeals to me the most in some games is when I can do this, when I can listlessly jump off or on something and the animation and controls come together to provide this tactile response that I keep chasing like a drug. But it wasn't all fun and games. Remember the rock fixture, with its smooth slates and trickling stream? Well, I became obsessed with climbing it. The first step is easy, and as is the second and third, you're led into thinking this is possible. The precipice is so close, each leap effortless, and then Well, you can't. There's a barrier. It's physically impossible to reach the top. It's obvious it's impossible, but I couldn't believe it. And I think there's a part of 23-year-old me that still believes there is a way. In previous Sonic games, and even within the level design of Sonic Adventure 2, you're incentivized to explore away from the path. Sometimes you're rewarded for it. So I started justifying my inability to climb, Surely I'll unlock something later that will allow me to... Maybe I need to 100% the game? But even with the bounce ability, I couldn't surpass whatever invisible limitations stood before me. Behind me, my chow, die one by one, but I no longer really care. I've completed the game utterly by this point, seen and unlocked every carting skin and level there is. S ranks across the board. The only thing keeping me from turning off the game is the climb. Looking back now, it reminds me of Sisyphus, the futile and desperate progression of a mountain that has determined your efforts of a naught. But, and Camus eat your heart out, I was smiling. I never once felt rage or anger or anything of the sort. I'd conduct a new alternate way to burst through Sega's bubble and watch it fail and try again. This went on for so long, so many hundreds of hours. And again, this was before laptops were as mainstream as they are now, before the internet really became a place you spent your life, before smartphones even existed. If my new friend was busy, I would sit in the dark with only the game audio for company and fall into a blue blur rhythm, a dissociative routine. It may have been the only way I coped with the loneliness already permeating into my life, though I didn't know that at the time. So, was it a waste of time? If you raise a Chow's level with a specific character from either Team Hero or Team Dark to maximum, they will evolve into either a Hero or Dark Chow, and you will be rewarded with a brand new garden to explore respectively. By the time the Heaven and Hell gardens were made available to me, through hard work, trial and tribulation, 
I had nearly given up on my goal of escaping the earthly restraints of the first garden. I had become disillusioned with the game, and though my attention was still kept by the honest-to-god complex machinations of the Chow simulation, I was no longer playing it the way it hadn't been intended. I was no longer longing to escape this map, I had grown accustomed to the fact there was a limitation that couldn't be overcome. Which is weird, because there's an argument to be made that the Heaven Garden with its ominous distant bells on a floating island, structures you can't reach, and animated clouds, all urges one to attempt to escape more than the default Eden Garden. And believe me, I did strive for freedom there too, just not as much. It's more open, pleasant, blissful, and decorated. Especially when compared to the Hell Garden with its rock walls, pool of blood, and sparse decor conveying a more claustrophobic feeling. This garden tells you from the outset that there is no escape. This is it. Yet neither garden inspired me the way the normal garden did, and so I rarely spent any time there. I always felt like one day I would spend a longer period of time in the Hell or Heaven Garden, preferably the Heaven one, but my avid interest in the game died at some point with the earthly one. I'm not sure why or when I stopped playing, nor at what arbitrary point I decided to stop trying to climb. It probably wasn't some landmark moment. My attention was probably just directed elsewhere. Maybe I got a new console and the smooth sides and static sea weren't good enough anymore. Maybe it was because Sonic 06 was around the corner and it was going to be so, 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 so much better than Sonic Adventure 2. Maybe I stopped trying to climb that cliff the moment the ascension intensified in my real life. Or maybe I just finally realised it was impossible. I feel like there's something significant to me, something personally poignant about a lonely child spending weeks of in-game time attempting to escape the limitations of an Eden-esque garden without results. Eventually you need to realise that external intentions outrule your own, and that's just the way it is sometimes. It kind of sucks being told you aren't able to do something, that you're not good enough, that you're not allowed the freedom. Not being allowed to escape and surpass limitations is so frustrating sometimes. And I know I'm not alone in that feeling, proven by the explosive popularity of open world games where boundaries are seen as taboo. There's just something about this little edge, this outright obstruction of progression and escalation that draws people, that draws me to it and consumes them like a magnet. Sometimes, infrequently, I dream about reaching the top of that collection of polygons, textures and code all beyond my complete comprehension. The decades roll by and yet I'm taken back to that force field, preventing me from advancing, usually in my more vulnerable moments. Through looming suicidal ideation, crippling melancholia, pacifying anhedonia, I'm reminded that sometimes not being able to escape, as frustrating as it is, might actually be better for me. If I had reached the top, I wouldn't have kept playing as long as I ultimately did. That trapped feeling was the only thing that stood between me and the game ending. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know uh, it's very um, personal, entirely personal, and um, I don't think all my content's gonna be like this, um, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. And perhaps some of you can share similar feelings of a game pushing limitations on you that ends up making it the game, because to be honest, getting on top of that, that mountain was the game. That is Sonic Adventure 2 for me. When I look back, there are moments like fighting Biohazard and etc etc that all comes clearly but really the memory that, that rules over all the others is getting to the top of that mountain or trying to anyway and I just wanted to share this very specific feeling. Um, I hope anyone who's watched this has a very good day and, uh, and just in case even though it wasn't the main thesis or uh, main theme of this video I have left some numbers in the description just in case. Um, thank you.